Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven. Thank you again for uh, being here and listening today. Um, our guest today is Dr. Amantha Imber. Uh, she is an organizational psychologist and founder of the behavioral science consultancy Inventium. Um, so Amantha and I um, share a belief. Um, it says on the front page of her website, work doesn't have to suck. And that's something I've uh, believed and uh, agreed with for a long time. Uh, Amantha is the author of two best-selling books, The Creativity Formula and The Innovation Formula. She's the host of a podcast called How I Work. So with all that, Amantha, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm very well, Mark. How are you? I'm doing well. I hope I didn't make any mistakes there in the introduction. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and listeners might be wondering, where are you joining us? They may have a guess, but where are you joining us from today? <laughs> yes, well, if you, if you guessed Australia, you were absolutely correct. <laughs> and more specifically, Melbourne, Australia, um, possibly known for being the lockdown capital of the world because we spent about 265 days all up in lockdown. So there you go. Gosh. Are you doing okay from that? Yes, I am. I am. Yes, the you know, yes, millions of people have been emerging and sort of finding finding their freedom again over the last month or so. So that that's been very exciting and also overwhelming for a lot of people as well. Yeah. So um, I don't know if uh, pandemic mistakes or lockdown mistakes will be on the agenda today, <laughs> but you know, I appreciate that yeah, that you've written. Um, openly about mistakes, and we'll come back and, and talk about this later on. Um, for the listeners, I, I discovered uh, Amantha and her work because of a, a really interesting and thought-provoking article she wrote on LinkedIn about what she calls a, a failure resume. So I'm going to ask you to, to talk about that and elaborate on that um, a little bit later on. But you know, as we always do, Amantha, um, we'll kind of dive into the key question to get things started. You know, looking at the the work you've done, what would you say is your favorite mistake? Oh, there were so many to choose from, but I would say a very fundamental mistake that I made for many, many years, the majority of my career, is linking my achievements to my self-worth. Mm. And whenever I would achieve something, I would, I think, mistakenly believe, well, that makes me a better person, that makes me a more likable person, um, and, you know, that should make me a happier person and a more mm. confident person. And, and, and that is a really big mistake to make that I see a lot of people, and certainly even people on my team at Inventium make. I think when you're a type A, high achieving kind of personality type, it's really easy to, uh, to link those two things together when really they should be separate. Like you, you are not your achievements. Um, you are a person outside of that. And I remember mm -hmm. I read this great blog from Seth Godin many years ago, and he said, confidence, confidence is a choice. And I mm -hmm. always used to think that confidence was something I earned when I had enough achievements under my belt. Uh, and oh. that really stuck with me. So that, I think, is a very fundamental mistake that I have made. I still make that mistake, but I think I make mm -hmm. it less in terms of linking yeah. my achievements to my self-worth. So back to the Seth Godin thought, I, I guess the idea is, you know, confident com confidence hopefully comes more from your character and your abilities and potential, not just what has been achieved. That's right. Like, it's not... It's not this end point. Like I remember when when I was younger, I was in my mid-20s and I'd been headhunted for a job in advertising where I was working at the time as a consumer psychologist. And I was based in Melbourne and a big ad agency had approached me to work in Sydney as a senior strategist and uh, consumer psychologist. And I was very excited, but I was convinced that they hadn't read my resume properly and that they were making this big fatal error employing me for quite a senior role when I just felt like I didn't have the knowledge or experience under my belt. And I remember before I started that job in Sydney, I caught up with this guy I knew who was one of the only other consumer psychologists that there was in Australia at that time. And he was always someone that seemed really confident in his ability and he had 
more years of experience than me. And I said to him, or I asked him, at what point did you just start to feel really confident in your ability as a consumer psychologist? And he said to me, I still don't. I just Mm. fake it. Uh, I pretend to be confident and then people trust what you say. And that really stuck with me. It's like, oh, so I'm not going to hit this end destination where I suddenly feel confident. I suddenly feel like I have all the answers. Yeah. And that's actually okay. So that was a bit of a revelation for me. So I I was, uh, and it sounds like you've touched on that. I, I was going to ask, how did you discover this habit or this pattern of you know, linking achievements to self-worth? Was it was it discussions like that? Were there other things that were eye-opening to you, Amantha? Yeah, there were a few things. It was definitely discussions like that. Uh, mm-hmm. I became aware that when I would catch up with friends and they would go, how are you? The first thing I would think of is what, have I achieved since I've mm-hmm. last seen them that mm-hmm. I can share in conversation because that will make them like me more. And um, and I also experienced the same thing. So I separated and divorced from my now ex-husband a couple of years ago. And so that's been interesting dating as, as a, you know, as, as a woman in her 40s and I became aware that on some dates I would feel the need to talk about my achievements because I feel I felt that that would make me more likable. And I learned that, well, no, people like you for who you are and your values and how mm. you treat them as opposed to what you've achieved. And I think it was just reflecting on conversations that I'd had in, in those two sort of scenarios. And finally, not, not so much with work conversations that, that really hit home on that point mm-hmm. for me. Yeah, because you know, looking at at your your track record um, between education and uh, being an entrepreneur and an author, it sounds like there are a lot of achievements that you could use as a foundation for self worth. Um, so, so having you know, b- being being successful, even if you have your doubts of you know, gosh, am, am am I the right person for these roles or am I the right person for these clients? So if you could just share a little bit more of, of the reflection of even with success coming you know, to this, this recognition that um, you know, self-worth comes from other factors. Yeah, I think it's, it's like it's been, I would say, it's a constant battle because while I've come to this realisation, it's not like that just solves everything and makes everything Mm -hmm. easier like now it's it's almost like before I catch up with a friend you know I'll I'll sometimes reflect on oh what's what's happened and you know if they ask how I'm going like what what will I share uh and um that that might sound weird but like I'm quite introverted and so I do Mm -hmm. I do think about these things and you know before events that I go to I'm like what will I talk about with people Mm -hmm. and I guess it's like instead of defaulting to achievements, I will maybe think about, well, what are some interesting stories that have happened mm-hmm. to me uh, that, you know, that, that someone else might find interesting as opposed to thinking, what have I achieved? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how would you describe, you know, the impact of this, this mistake of, let's say, for example, you know, talking about achievements will make this, this hypothesis of talking about achievements will make me more likable. Like, did you, did you, were, were, were there things where you realized like, you know, moments where you realized that it's not playing out that way that would lead you to, like you said, try to avoid repeating that as often that, that mistake, if you will. thinking if there were moments I know that there were moments where I realized I'd changed so I had this experience a few weeks ago and then it repeated itself with another friend so I walked with I went on a walk with a friend a few weeks ago and he said what have you been up to in the last couple of months and I said I'm actually like this is the first weekend I've had in a while where I haven't been working because I've been writing a book, I'd been on deadline Mm -hmm. and I'd submitted it to my publisher uh, 
like a couple of weeks before I met with him and he said, what, you're writing a book? And for me that was <laughs> like that sounds like, a you know, just like an innocuous comment, oh, I, I forgot to tell him I was writing a book, but the book was a big deal. It was a it, right. it was a book deal with Penguin, who are obviously a big publisher, mm-hmm. and it's hard to get book deals with big publishers because they right. only publish so many books every year. And I'd actually failed to tell him that I got offered a book deal, you know, six or eight months prior. And I thought that's real progress for me because normally mm-hmm. I'd be leading mm-hmm. with that story because that's yeah. going to make me more likable because I've got this like book deal. Uh, but the fact that I did it made me go that's actually really cool. I feel quite proud of the fact that he didn't know about this thing. And then I had the same thing happen with another friend who I'd caught up with and, uh, and, and the book project came into conversation. I can't remember how, but I just completely failed to tell them that this big thing had happened many months ago and we'd had several catch ups since, but I just hadn't mentioned it. And that made me feel like I'd made some progress. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's progress is a good thing. You know, I'll take progress over perfection, at least in terms of expectations. Um, you, you, you talked earlier about how you, you know, you, you try to change and developing new habits or getting rid of old habits can be difficult. One, one, one other question before, you know, we talk about failure resume and other, other things. You know, I'm, I'm curious, your thoughts as a psychologist, as a behavioral scientist, thoughts or uh, advice you might share with the audience, reflections on trying to develop new habits and and or getting rid of old habits, things that are helpful in that regard? Goodness me. Uh, I've, I've read a lot about habit change and I, like it's an area that I'm so fascinated by. I think the best advice that I've heard uh, would be, probably come from BJ Fogg. So he's a behaviorist, works out of Stanford, Mm -hmm. and he wrote the book Tiny Habits. And I interviewed BJ on my podcast, How I Work, maybe a year and a half ago. And like he's into forming new habits through just making them really tiny. So things Mm -hmm. that take less than 30 seconds to do and are really easy to do and tying them to things that we're doing already. So, for example, if you're trying to create the habit of flossing your teeth every night, Mm -hmm. you probably brush your teeth every night right now. That's already an ingrained habit. Mm -hmm. So BJ would say, well, link the new habit that you want to try to the old one, but just make it tiny. So he would say, after you brush your teeth every night, just floss one tooth. Mm -hmm. which sounds crazy. But the thing is, once you start flossing one tooth, you'll naturally expand (laughs) on that habit, which I love. And the other thing that I love about how he frames up habit change is the key to a habit sticking is linking it with positive emotion Mm -hmm. because you want to do things that make you feel good. Um, you know, that's why, you know, we, we, people compulsively check social media because we get that dopamine hit when we get new likes or follows or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, you know, if with the tooth flossing example, like just go, yay, or, you know, like some celebratory kind of act that makes you feel good when you do that new thing, that will make that habit more sticky. So what I hear you saying is framing something in terms of developing a new positive habit might be more helpful than saying, I'm going to eliminate an old habit. So let's say framing might be uh, from a negative, you know, I, I'm going to stop eating badly. And instead of reframing it as I'm going to start eating well and celebrate, let's say the one piece of broccoli that then leads maybe to a, a whole plate of broccoli. <laughs> that, that's definitely, I, I like that way of looking at it. I think something else that I think is, is very helpful when it's about trying to stop a behaviour is I read some research uh, that was, gosh, I'm just trying to, I think, trying to think of which university it was from, um, but it was, uh, it was from a marketing department where they were looking at the impact of self-talk on, interestingly, consuming more healthy foods. And in this particular study, uh, it was um, they'd set up an experiment where people were taught a strategy to help encourage healthier eating. uh, And the strategy was 
to stay away from junk food, they were taught to either say, I can't eat a junk food or chocolate or something specific like that versus I don't eat junk food or I don't Mm. eat chocolate. So just one simple word difference in terms of the strategy that they were taught. And what they found um, is that the group that were taught to say, I don't eat junk food were, um, were, were something like 50% uh, more likely to pick a healthy snack at the end of the experiment. So at the end of the experiment, everyone left, they were offered a, a healthy muesli bar or a chocolate bar upon leaving. And yeah, those that said, I don't eat junk food were 50% more likely to pick the healthy snack, hmm. the, the healthy bar. So I think when we're trying to like not do something, framing it as I don't do this is very effective because it becomes part of our self-identity. And psychologically speaking, we don't want to do things that clash with our identity. So that's a little trick for trying to not do behaviours. Yeah. Well, good. That's that's very helpful, Amantha. Um, So I want to talk about your failure resume and that move of publishing that publicly or at least as public as, let's say, LinkedIn gets as a forum. And, you know, why you wrote it, and I thought it was interesting that you framed it as part of an experiment. I was wondering if you could share with us more about that. So it was initially part of an experiment I did in early 2020 before the pandemic changed all our lives. And I, you know, as a psychologist, I read so many research findings about how to improve our life. And... I thought I'm going to turn myself into a human guinea pig and every couple of Mm. weeks I'm going to try a new strategy and see if that changes things. And then I sort of put that out to my networks and had about 1,500 people go, yes, I want to be on that journey too. And and they, um, you know, kindly completed lots of surveys along, you know, these experiments that we were trying to change various things. And one of the experiments was writing a failure resume, the idea being rather than write a traditional resume where you talk about everything that's great about yourself and all your achievements, this was about writing about what have been the key and most pivotal, pivotal, most humiliating, terrible, awful failures that you've had in your life. And you could just limit it to work or you could open it up to your personal life as well. And writing about those failures uh, and then also writing about what you learned from those failures. So that was that was the concept. And the thinking behind that is that if we can actually label uh, and talk about those uncomfortable things, they actually it actually de-intensifies those things for us and at the same time boosts resilience. So mm. that's the, the research, if you like, behind the merits of writing a failure resume. So did um, you get feedback from others? Did other people share their failure resumes publicly or with you? Yes, a lot. So many people, so many people. Uh, and, and it was really amazing. And at the time when I first did my failure resume, so I repeated the process a few weeks ago. Uh, but when I first did it, I shared my failure resume with my team at Inventium, just in the spirit of sharing and, mm-hmm. you know, as, as a leader in the business. And just like, without asking every single person decided to also write a failure resume Mm. and share that with the team and it was really beautiful like at the end of the week when everyone had done that no one had been asked it's completely unlike you know uh, you know spontaneous I think we all just felt this common sense of closeness to each other Mm -hmm. and like the the trust and the intimacy between the team members had just really gone up quite significantly through doing that exercise Mm -hmm. um I mean, you know, I've done a little, I, I I should go and write more of a failure resume. I'll share a link to yours in uh, the show notes for people. Uh, but I, 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 I was the um, initiator and editor of a book project maybe about five or six, six years ago. And that book was called Practicing Lean because I work in a field, we use the term lean as this business improvement methodology. But the idea was to write about an early failure in your career. So in a way, it was a precursor to doing you know, the My Favorite Mistake podcast. And I shared a couple of mistakes that I had made in the spirit of reflecting and sharing, here's what I learned from it, here's what I wish I would have done differently, as a way of trying to show some grace towards others who are maybe early in their career and making mistakes. And then I had 15 other people 
share at least a portion of their, we, we didn't call it a failure resume, but I, I think it's a very similar concept. And, and people have, have, have said it's helpful because the one habit I was trying to change um, was you know uh, being judgmental toward people who were making a mistake early in their career. How do they not know any better? Well, well they don't. And I think that was a healthy thing to, to reflect on. And uh, maybe listeners will, will write and share some failure resumes with us. That'd be cool. Um, but the, I love this idea. You, you talked about these different experiments and um, like, do, do you remember how many different experiments you found? Like, it seemed like there could be a book here where each chapter is about one of your <laughs> experiments. Do yeah. these, did these things work for you or not? Yeah, so I think I got to about seven experiments in and then COVID hit and that completely changed the Mm. focus. So I called the project My Year of Better. Uh, And I think if you Google My Year of Better and then my name, Amantha Imba, you could probably find a link to where all those experiments and the data is sitting. But then I, I kind of, you know, focus changed and I stopped that. But it is actually a project that I'm thinking of coming back to um, mm-hmm. possibly with a potential collaborator. So uh, so watch this space because I, I'm, I'm very into the idea of self-experimentation. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, get so much joy from that. And that, that, sort of, that, that, that comes through both in the way you wrote about these mistakes and the learning and, and the way you're talking about it here. Um, in, in that piece, one thing that you said was that your natural inclination was to hide your failures. So why, why, why was that? What were some of your reflections about that habit of trying to hide mistakes instead of being open about them? It comes back, I would say, to this tendency to, to link my self-worth uh, to my achievements. And so yeah. if I were to admit my failures and mistakes, then people would think less of me was the logic that I used in my brain when actually I think the opposite is most Mm -hmm. definitely true. And, you know, I think as a leader, like the, you know, I mean, I feel like, you know, talking about being vulnerable as a leader has just, you know, become a bit of a cliche and it's so overused, but, you know, there really is something, um, you know, very important, I think, to just, to, to being, you know, really open and just human with, with your team, like not Mm -hmm. only will, that improve just the general connectedness that you have. Um, but I, I just think it makes you more effective as, as a leader, mm-hmm. like not having to, you know, wear right. a mask to work or anything like that. And you mean more of like not not a COVID physical mask. Yeah, because <laughs> not that a piece, physical mask. <laughs> you, you talk about more of it, more of an emotional mask that you were wearing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's not a physical mask, although that can be good as well for COVID safety, but no, right, right. a metaphorical <laughs> mask in this case. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm not a psychologist, so but asking about your child childhood seems like a you know a stereotypical sort of you know therapy question. But in the piece, you kind of you brought this up. Like, where where do you think some of these patterns um, developed coming out of childhood? You, you described yourself as uh, I'll ask you to elaborate on this, of course, but with the, one other thing that stood out to me and in a resonate, I saw some of myself in this, in addition to being competitive, I was also a perfectionist. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about why or how you just, how, how, how you came to see that as um, maybe a bit of a problem or a mistake. Yes. So I was, I was very, I was very competitive, uh, Really from an early age, from primary school, I remember one of the other people that I went to school with, her name was Bonnie Smart, and she definitely lived up to that surname and and I felt like she was my arch nemesis. So on any <laughs> test in primary school, and my God, who's even thinking about test results in primary school? But I was and I was like gutted if Bonnie did better than me. Um, but yeah, I was also a perfectionist and, you know, like if I got an A for something, I'd, I'd think to myself, but I didn't get an A plus, like, why didn't I get an A plus? And I'd beat myself up over that. And look, in terms of where did that come from? I mean, I think that, you know, children learn a lot from their parents, uh, 
you know, my parents are both high achieving in in their respective fields. Mum's a psychologist, dad's an engineer. Um, you know, they're both incredibly uh, like clever, clever people. And I also think of myself as a parent to a seven and a half year old girl. And I think it's it's really hard when you identify yourself as someone that, you know, that strives to achieve to not impose those values on your child or mm-hmm. your children. I think that kind of happens unconsciously. Like, um, you know, I mean, my daughter's only in year two at the moment. So, you know, academic results are, you know, not really a, a thing that, uh, you know, that, that she's kind of, you know, thinking about or worrying about. But I'm very aware of my own biases that I put on to, you know, like when I see a report card, it's like I want her to be exceeding expectations. Um, and so if she's just meeting expectations, my inner voice is like, well, why? What's wrong? What should I do? But it's like nothing's wrong. Mm-hmm. Like she's not you and stop imposing your beliefs. So I think it's really it's something that I try to think about a lot as a parent. Mm-hmm. And I think that for people that are, like me and can relate, uh, you know, I think it probably is to a large extent passed down by just the environment that we grow up in and what's yeah. valued. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a parent, but I have heard and seen articles where you, you're, what you're saying comes to mind, um, this, this discovery that it's better to praise children for trying hard or working hard than it is to praise them for being smart. Because one of those yes. is a one of those things is a behavior. One of those things is to some level innate, and why why um, you know take the credit for being born with a, you know a certain level of uh, capability. Is that something that you've thought about as a psychologist and or as a parent? So much, Mark. Like I love mm-hmm. this. Like in terms of fixed versus growth mindset, yeah. and I. I'm very, yeah, I'm quite obsessed with the idea of not calling my daughter clever or Mm -hmm. going, you're so clever, like you're so smart, Um, but it's all about trying. It's like Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of you because you tried so hard. Um, I'm really proud of you because you were really struggling with spelling, but now you've really put in effort to, to, you know, to, to, to learn how to spell these words or something like that. So it's all yeah. about the effort that is put in and how hard she's trying because they're the things that make us better, whereas mm-hmm. it's quite useless and quite damaging for me to go, oh, you're so clever, you're so clever, because then if she thinks she's clever, she maybe will discount the idea of having to work to achieve things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, um, you know, two people I, I would love to interview here on the podcast, not just BJ Fogg, but when you mentioned, you know, uh, growth mindset or the book mindset, Carol Dweck is, um, I think somebody who is, uh, I don't know, pa- patron saints, not the right way of saying it, but <laughs> I think this idea of growth mindset is one of the key ideas behind the type of people who are willing to come on here and talk about mistakes and growing and learning and trying hard and not always being perfect, but but getting better through through that process. So that's a, a reminder. Maybe I'll uh, I, I need to. I, I think I did reach out to uh, to her once, but I'll I'll be more persistent. I'll I'll focus on the effort, not <laughs> saying the podcast is that's clever. Right. She should want to be on it. <laughs> that's right. Try harder, Mark. Will, Just try harder. Keep... <laughs> and I take that as encouragement, Amantha. So thank you. For... <laughs> That's right. Not not me berating you. No. Um, <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> I can do it. I, I will. I'm, I'm jotting that down to uh, to try <laughs> again. Uh, and if any listener has a, a connection to make an introduction, I, I will certainly take some help, though, beyond my effort. So um, our guest again here, uh, Amantha Imber, uh, your firm Inventium. Tell us a little bit about the type of work that you do, who, who are the clients that you work with. So we're a behavioural science consultancy. We've been around for 15 years now and we we help people, broadly speaking, perform better at work. But the sort of specific work that we've been involved in a lot is particularly helping knowledge workers, so people that are paid to use their brain for a living, 
get better at doing deeper focused work in the age of digital distraction, helping them think more creatively and innovatively about the problems that they're facing um, and, you know, really navigating this future of work that is completely different to how we thought it would be two years ago. Like how Mm. do we get the best out of hybrid teams, which is, you know, really the way of the future where we're Mm. not all going to be co-located five days a week. So that's the sort of work that we do. And look, we largely work with corporates we do work all over the world and we work with a lot of multinationals um like we've done work with companies like google and apple and lego and deloitte and um you know all sorts of organizations uh that you know really uh uh, you know really kind of i guess value going how how can we get the best out of people and also help people enjoy their work more in the age where our attention span is is literally six minutes. That is how long the average person goes, um, you know, without checking email or instant messenger, six minutes, according to research from Rescue Time. You've kept my attention for a 30 minutes here without peeking at email or my phone or social media. <laughs> no, no need for, for that dopamine burst. And hopefully the listeners have been doing the same, especially if they're listening while they're driving. You know, the, that, the, that driving and listening is multitasking um, enough, of course. Um, so I'll put a link to Inventium in the show notes. Uh, Amantha's website is uh, real easy to find. It's amantha.com. <laughs> that name, thankfully, was, was available for you. Because hey, have you ever met another Amantha? Probably not. Actually, I, I have. So while I was doing my doctorate in organizational psychology I was pursuing a career as a musician as well on the side and um I I did actually have a couple of Amanthas get in touch with me through finding my music which was very strange (laughs) so yes but that is it I think they were possibly in America so there you go and uh that that album was named like Samantha without the s which is how you would describe your your research. That's that's perfect. (laughs) I haven't listened to it. I need to go. Is it on Spotify? (laughs) It is nowhere. It is nowhere to be found. It was literally just before uh, iTunes took off when I was working on that. So yeah, it can't be found, unfortunately, or fortunately for me. (laughs) Or maybe someday at amantha.com, there might be a music section, but for now you can learn more (laughs) about her books and her work. And final question for you, the podcast, How I Work. What, what kinds of uh, topics do you cover on that podcast? Yeah, look, that, that podcast is for, you know, maybe people that are like us that are, are really, you know, striving to always get better and improve. So I interview some of the world's most successful people, um, you know, like BJ Fogg, like mm-hmm. um, Adam Grant, uh, Dan mm-hmm. Pink, I'm sure listeners mm-hmm. would be familiar with those names. And I unpack, like, how are they using their time differently to the rest of us mere mortals? So it's very um, tactics and tools and strategy based uh, because I want to know what are they doing differently mm-hmm. to, you know, use their time so well. Uh, so if you're into that kind of stuff, you'll probably like how I work. Well, I think people listening here to my favorite mistake will find that interesting. I'm going to go check it out. So I encourage people to go find uh, How I Work, uh, Amantha Imber as the host there. Uh, Dan Pink has agreed to be a guest here on My Favorite Mistake because he has a new book coming out and he's talking a lot about sharing failures, learning from failures. Um, So I'm looking forward to to having him on here, but I've, I've enjoyed very much. Uh, the chance to talk with you, Amantha. That seems like a rude thing to thank a podcast guest by think talk, <laughs> talking about a future a future guest. Keep my focus here in the moment. Uh, Amantha. <laughs> no, Ember. but Dan's very exciting. You, you know, he's a great guest. <laughs> and Dan is great. So so are you. So I uh, hope everyone will check out Amantha.com and go check out uh, her piece on the failure resume. Again, I will link to that in the show notes and uh, maybe we'll, we'll get another wave of failure resumes and, and maybe people sharing those on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. Thanks. Thanks for being a guest, Samantha.